So let's, let's look at a few uh, of these biomarkers uh, that you would receive uh, when you start looking into this physiology. So on one hand, we're going to look at this fuel source. Um, so I compared, um, this is a paleo uh, dieter. Uh, so their fasting blood sugar level is at 80. Um, and uh, when I was talking to Tina earlier, she said, you know, how do you differentiate between kind of the, the health and the fitness? Because like Jim alluded to, the medical model is absence or presence of disease. Everything else is okay. The range of what's considered normal for glucose is anywhere between uh, 60 and 100. Um, the way that I look at it is, is that when you are optimally fit, you have a blood sugar level fasting probably in the high 60s mid to mid 70s. 80s is pretty good. Um, when you start to get 90s, uh, I think, nah, you're not, you're not very efficient. And then 100 and above is recognized by medicine as uh, pre-diabetic metabolic syndrome. So insulin, uh, you want a nice low fasting insulin level. There's no indication of insulin resistance. And then this hemoglobin A1C is 4.7 if you can't see that, which means that their average blood sugar level when they're fasting and when they're eating is about is 88.2. So they're really tightly controlling um, their blood sugar regulation. It's going to tip up a little bit over 100 after a meal. But again, if you're eating a good paleo uh, unprocessed meal, it's a slow carb movement. You're, you're going to have to wrangle the carbohydrates out of these low glycemic vegetables and fruits, and it's going to trickle into the body. So it's a really tight, the body likes homeostasis. It likes to, to, to have things status quo. It wants a pH. It wants the same salt level. It doesn't like fluctuations. And in fact, uh, some literature that's just coming out now that um, these high carb diets, when we have a big spike in our blood sugar, part of what drives us to, to be ravenously hunger, hungry is, is that the rate of drop of the blood sugar once insulin starts driving it in. I'm going to contrast this to a very, very, very fit triathlete who's a carb loader. Um, so their fasting blood sugar is still pretty darn good. And if we would have just stopped there, we would have said, you're fine. But we got a hemoglobin A1C, and this person is actually pre-diabetic. You would never have looked, if you're looking at them, you would have never suspected that. But that blood sugar average difference is one point difference. That's a 30 point difference in their average blood sugar levels. So this person's average blood sugar level is around 118. So even though they're fasting at 79, it goes up to 118 24 hours a day. So you can just kind of think of if glucose shuts off the PGC1 master metabolic regulatory gene, you have a level of 118 compared to 88. That's a big difference, minute to minute, every minute of your life over the last three months, which that hemoglobin A1C indicates. So let's shift over. I mentioned methylation as this basic cog of, of how the body transforms molecules from one to another. Uh, and this person has a good, pretty good homocysteine. We'll skip the inflammatory markers for the moment. Um, and when you look correspondingly, uh, they have good B12, um, and good red blood cell folic acid levels. And so we could measure that. By the way, 55% um, of the population has at least one gene that's a variant that makes them less efficient at this process called methylation. 10% of the population has both genes out that makes them very inefficient. Um, and there have been several uh, people that have come through, a few high level uh, CrossFit trainers that had really terrible homocysteine levels. Their mood, they had over, classic overtraining system. They're in shape, but they're, they're, mo they're moody, they're miserable, they don't feel well, uh, and they had these really bad homocysteine levels. We cranked up their B12 and folic acid. That came down, changed their lives, they feel a lot better. Um, and then lastly, uh, just to look at systems biology, we'll look at the hormones. Everybody gets all excited about testosterone. I should have had a slide for the women because uh, it's just as fun to look at and testosterone is just as meaningful in the women. But I, I just wanted to compare and contrast. Um, this is an Olympian who competed in London uh, and their hormone milieu was very good. Testosterone uh, at a pretty robust 727, this is a 100 meter swimmer and uh, the range is 250 to 1250. So that looks pretty good. 
Um, they have a modest amount of sex hormone binding globulin. It's another marker that we look at for overtraining. When you start stressing the body, it starts trying to conserve everything. So it's going to build more binding proteins, uh, hold on to your testosterone, not let it to get to the tissue level so that it can affect your, uh, your skeletal muscle. And then DHEA S is a, is a mild anabolic substance that the adrenal glands produce uh, primarily. And if the body's under a lot of stress, just like exercise, um, session, you're going to make cortisol, you're going to shift the metabolic pathways, you're not going to make as much DHEA. Um, DHEAS is a kind of a more stable marker, and it's a pretty robust. So this was actually uh, a competitor at the CrossFit uh, Games uh, this past June, I guess. Uh, was it in June? Um, July? Yeah, okay. I was there, but... Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and uh, so, you know, this person is probably about... 25, 30 pounds uh, larger, mostly lean muscle. Um, you would expect bigger, hulking, massively strong dude. He would have big, hulking, massively strong testosterone. Uh, and it turns out that his testosterone was down at 466. Um, and then you also look at his DHEA. His DHEA is at 242. It's about half the level. Um, and you say, OK, he may have been overdoing it, and then luteinizing hormones, the signal from the brain telling the testes to produce testosterone. Um, and so we say, okay, you may have to tweak your training regimen here because it's starting to look like you're overtraining. Um, and had we caught him a little bit earlier, uh, we may have been able to show him that physiologically and impact him and try to get him up to a more of a peak performance from his hormone status uh, prior to his competition. Um, so, that's kind of a little bit of a biology session and a little look under the hood at the uh, Wellness FX system. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, thoughts, uh, throw them our way. Um, are you going to come talk first? Uh, and it, and it, I love hard, difficult questions, skeptical questions, every, all that. So thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in.